The inquest into the death of anti-apartheid activist Dr. Neil Agut has found that the activists did not commit suicide. The inquest says Agut was killed by the security police. Agut was the first white anti-apartheid activist to be killed in prison. Now, for more reaction on the story, I'm joined by human rights lawyer Yasmin Suka. Uh, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for your time. For it's, it's a matter that has really been, um, you know, under question for four decades, really, and two years the case has been underway. And finally, you know, some justice. What did you make of, of the outcome? Well, good afternoon to you and your listeners. Firstly, the judgment is really a vindication of the right to the truth about the past, both for the Agate family and, of course, for the families of other apartheid-era activists. Because what Judge Makume did today in summing up the evidence of the previous inquest and rejecting it meticulously really, in a sense, sets the record straight. And so for the family who probably knew that Neil was not the kind of person who would have taken his own life, to have a judge say this after a carefully, you know, a careful examination of the previous inquest records to come to this kind of ruling is a real vindication for them. In addition to that, you know, in the way in which Judge Makume went through the evidence, he also talked about this four-pager, which the security branch alleged, um, you know, Neil had incriminated his colleagues, and that that is why he felt so um, acutely bad about it, and that is why he took his own life. And he called it a fabrication. And he said that why was a, was a man who was so resolute in reporting the assault and torture upon him 15 hours before he died, why would he take his own life? And the judge referred quite often in his summing up to the evidence of the late Frank Dutton and the evidence of Stephen Naidu, the pathologist who re represented the family. And he said that it was absolutely clear that Dr. Agate was in such a weakened condition, given the long weekend of interrogation, 62 hours in all, that it was highly unlikely that he would have been able to climb up the grill to hang this kikoi and strangle himself with it. And so clearly, um, you know, the security branch had in fact fabricated all of that. He also said that Mr. Dutton made the point that um, in his view, summed up the behavior of the security police that um, there's, there's a gap really between the late night of the 4th of February and the early morning of the 5th of February. And he says this is not a coincidence. This was really to orchestrate the death scene. And he took us through the evidence and showed us where all of these gaps were. I was really touched by the fact that Judge Makume also took the trouble to deal with Neil Agut's character, and he referred to him as an idealist who was really deeply concerned about inequality and poverty in our country. Mm -hmm. And he said that Neil was deeply offended by the inequalities imposed on black people and people of color in our country, and that as a trade union organizer, all he wanted to do was the best for his country. And he associated himself with the oppressed people of South Africa. So, you know, when, when you listen to him, you get the image of a judge who meticulously went through the former inquest findings. He was also scathing about the former inquest judge, and he said that it was quite clear that he was biased and he was already predisposed to take on um, the verdict of, you know, a suicide and that he wanted to protect the security branch at all costs. And in that way, he prevented, um, you know, and didn't really take into account the evidence of people like Jabo Nguenia and Caesar in Jikalani. And he says their evidence was actually vital to the first inquest, and it was a great pity that the judge didn't listen to them. So a very good judgment. And of course, we are, you know, we're still waiting for the written judgment and once we study it, we'll get a better idea of where the judge was leaning to. But what he did say is that 
the security branch were responsible for Neil's death. They killed him. And, you know, the two officers implicated, Stephen Con Cronwright and um, uh, Arthur Cronwright and Stephen Whitehead, of course, both of them are dead, but there are security branch officials who were implicated both in the assault on Neil and, of course, the torture and the cover-up, and many of them are alive, and they should be investigated. And that's really what we should be urging the Hawks and the NPA to do, to ensure that they do this speedily and charge them so that we will not have the same situation like we did in the Ahmed Timor case, where we rejoiced that Ja Rodriguez had been indicted, but it took so many years um, and he never actually faced the might of the law. So we need to be very different in the way in which the NPA behaves around this case. As you make mention of the details and how meticulous uh, Judge uh, Makume was when he, um, you know, went out to, to see the bias and the interest more uh, towards uh, the lack of interest in finding out what happened, but perhaps rather the focus on why, why he may have killed himself, which was not so, we also get some insight on the sort of um, narrative and the mission when it comes to the apartheid era policing system which was something that was really fleshed out, especially by the former apartheid special branch policeman, Paul Erasmus. Absolutely. And in fact, um, throughout the judgment, um, Judge Makume references Paul's evidence um, in the way in which the security branch behaved. And he talked about the fact that if Neil Agat had taken his own life, why would he, you know, um, Stephen um, Whitehead, take Paul Erasmus with him on this trip to actually find evidence at um, Stephen's parents' home and at his old university that he was suicidal. And he says that this is the kind of things that they got up to to absolutely prove, um, you know, that the person they were dealing with was in fact connected either to the ANC or to, had been um, dealing in, you know, um, activities which would be tantamount to treason. And so it's very, very clear that you, you get a real picture of the institution and the way in which the security branch operated and the way in which those practices of torture and the cover up of the deaths of people in detention actually came about. And remember, you had a whole range of activists who were in prison at the same time testifying to their torture at the hands of the same people. And in fact, what was really interesting was the reference even to the Timor matter, because, for instance, when someone like Prema Naidu was taken up to the 10th floor, he was told that this is the Timor floor, mm -hmm. and when we finish with you, we're going to call it the Naidu floor. So, you know, that callousness and brutality, I think, is something that is still very, very painful for many, many activists. And of course, when they testified at the second inquest, many of them spoke to the fact that when they were giving evidence in the first inquest, they were also acutely aware of the fact that many of their security branch torturers were sitting there. And so they could not be completely truthful about what had happened to them as well. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, some of the black policemen who had been on duty at the time also spoke about the way in which Conrad actually wrote their statements that they had to give in to the first inquest. So you can see that this was a well-ordered machinery, um, which was terribly brutal um, and had no qualms at all about torturing people and then killing them and then covering that up. And so, you know, the news around this inquest, I think, is going to give hope to many of the families of detainees who actually died in very similar circumstances at the hands of the security branch, um, you know, particularly in John Foster Square. Absolutely. And um, it's, it, you make mention as you were speaking about the role of the NPA and the pace at which the NPA is moving towards prosecuting apartheid era crimes. In an article that you wrote last year, you spoke about how there's more than 300 apartheid uh, cases handed over by the TRC to the NPA in 1998 and uh, saying that uh, most of them have probably just uh, fallen through the cracks. Nothing has been done. Families are still asking questions. 
Well, you know, the, this is the sad thing about, I think, the institutions under the democratic state and, of course, the state itself, because when the Ahmed Timur um, matter was heard, you know, after Ja Rodriguez was indicted and he took his matter on appeal, you had the NPA file two affidavits from two of the senior prosecutors, and in there, both of them allege that they were interfered with in doing their work and that there had been a moratorium from 2003 onwards into the investigations of these cases. Now, this was, of course, already earlier alluded to by Busi Piccoli in the 2016 matter when the Similani family went to court to compel the NPA to make a decision to prosecute in the enforced disappearance. And Vusi alleged that he had been interfered with when he tried to deal with the TRC cases. We also know from the um, Supreme Court of Appeal judgment that the court has confirmed that the state interfered and deliberately suppressed the investigation and prosecution of TRC cases and that the NPA and the Hawk followed suit. And, you know, even in this particular case, you have the death of so many people who would have been valuable witnesses. At the time when the Agat family first approached the NPA, Stephen Whitehead was still alive. And in fact, we got the notification from the Minister of Justice that he had agreed to reopen the inquest. But that was after Stephen Whitehead had died. And so the family immediately suspected that there might even be a conspiracy and that it only happened now. But of course, it was Ronald Lamola who made the decision to reopen the inquest. But, you know, in the last few years, Paul Erasmus died. Um, Frank Dutton died this year. And so this is the battle that we have. In the case of Nakatula Samalani, which will begin in May this year, her aunt, who is one of the critical witnesses, died a few weeks ago. If you look at the Craddock 4 case, um, F.W. de Klerk died and has many other of the people who are implicated. And so unless the NPA begins to get its act together and to really begin to exert um, you know, an honest investigation and prosecution into these cases, I'm afraid that the families of victims are going to experience further injustices. And that is sad, not just for them, but also for us, because at the end of the day, we as a society are entitled also to the truth about what happened in our country. Because as you can see, these were also institutions that were captured. They were institutions of the state. And we need to know who has been tainted by that capture. And, you know, this is an injunction that the Supreme Court of Appeal also made, that the NPA needs to clean up its own house. But we are yet to see any signs of that. So how do we know who the people are who are working on these cases? We actually asked for a dedicated team made up of both prosecutors and investigators who would form a dedicated unit committed to the TRC cases with a special director appointed by the president, because that's the only way that these cases will get the attention that they deserve. Um, and that's really an imperative going forward. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and weighing in on this discussion. Human rights lawyer Yasmin Suka uh, speaking, of course, about the Dr. Neil Agat judgment.